What if Satan should impersonate Christ? How would you know that it wasn't Jesus? We need to know something about how Jesus is going to come. What would you do if all of a sudden it appeared on the news one day that Jesus had arrived? All of a sudden there's a, a news report and all around the world uh, TV cameras are tuning in. Would you go and sit down in front of the TV? Would you think that Jesus had come? He looked just like Jesus, sounded just like Jesus. News reporters are saying, Jesus has returned, and all the cameras are flocking to hear the words and maybe doing some of the same miracles. Can the devil do some miracles? Doesn't Revelation say that he will perform wonders? How would you respond? We need to know how Jesus is coming. Now, I, I want to be very delicate in what I'm going to share because there are principally two conflicting views among Christians regarding how Jesus is going to come. You know, there are probably hundreds of different variants of those views, but there are two primary views. Let me share with you briefly what they are. The first view is that when the rapture occurs, the church will be caught up and the lost are left behind alive for seven years of tribulation. Then at the end of that seven years, Jesus comes back with the church that's been raptured and he then sets up his millennial kingdom here on earth. The other view is that the rapture takes place at the end of the time of tribulation. Now, virtually all Christians agree, and I hope if you hear something you didn't believe before, or you don't agree with, that we can agree disagreeably. Does that sound fair? Are we Christians? Don't we want to study together and find out what the Bible teaches? I mean, isn't it time, when Jesus comes back, aren't we going to be united as a people? Amen. How's it ever going to happen if we don't study together? if we're not afraid to ask questions and explore. So in a Christian way, let's look at these things and find out what the Bible teaches. Now, I'm not going to be hedgy, and I'll tell you right out that when I first became a Christian, I worshiped with people who believed the popular view of what we call the secret rapture. Now, the Bible doesn't really teach the word rapture. Rapture means to be carried away with force or power. And that's where actually you get the word rape. It means to be carried away by force or with power. And uh, we believed it was the secret, or at least the people I worship with did, and that the tribulation happened afterward, and that uh, we were caught up, and when the Lord came, people would suddenly disappear. It's basically the left-behind scenario that has been made very popular. And then there's the other view that is a more traditional view. Um, some of you maybe had heard about a famous book written by Hal Lindsey years ago called The Late Great Planet Earth. Let me give you a little history here. How many remember this book? I think, what is it, 15 million copies sold. Back in the 1500s, a Jesuit priest named Francisco Ribera was commissioned by our Catholic friends to study Revelation and kind of come up with what they called a counter-interpretation because the Protestant movement, uh, the reformers, and I'm thinking of people like Luther, and Zwingli and Melanchthon and Calvin, they taught that the church would be in the world during the tribulation and we were caught up when Jesus came back and the wicked were destroyed at that time. But the Catholics were really having struggles with the Protestants and so they said, we need a counter-interpretation. So Ribeiro wrote this interpretation that really didn't become very popular until a man named Darby, who was the founder of the Plymouth Brethren. Have you heard that church? It's called Darby's until he embraced that. And that still didn't take off, but what really made it popular was a man named Schofield. Any of you ever heard of the Schofield Bible? He incorporated Darby's interpretation of Revelation in his Bible notes. And how Lindsay believed that, as well as some others, and popularized it with some books. So that amazing thing that happened is Protestants began to believe the Jesuit interpretation of prophecy, which basically says, Revelation 4, when John hears a trumpet, and he's caught up in vision, that's the rapture, and everything from Revelation 4 on happens after the church is left. Now that's one view. I don't believe that. What I'm going to share with you from the Bible is really a very old view. What I'm going to share with you, a more traditional view, is the view that was believed by, well, like I said, you know, Luther and Calvin and Zwingli and, uh, and Tyndale and Wycliffe and... Uh, Billy Sunday and Dwight Moody, and I could just go down the line. I mean, it was a very standard teaching until the last 80 years or so. In Hal Lindsey's book, for instance, he believed that because Israel was being established as a nation in 1948, for which I'm thankful, 
that a generation later, 1981, the rapture would take place, and then after seven years of tribulation in 1988, then Jesus would come back down with the church and establish his millennial kingdom. None of it happened. None of it happened. And yet they keep selling books. No public apology. No saying, you know, we were wrong. And this has been true over and over again. Some of those who embrace these things keep using this philosophy, and it's falling apart. I believe that everyone's going to know when Jesus comes. Now, I want to move along here. Uh, if this was view, if this uh, is a correct deduction, then within 40 years or so, Hal Lindsey says in late great planet Earth, 1948, all these things will take place. Well, none of them happened, and there was no apology published. Many scholars who have studied the Bible prophecy all of their lives believe that this is so. Well, that's uh, those who went along with Darbyism. And then, of course, you know, uh, we've all heard of Tim LaHaye, and he wrote the series of books with uh, Jenkins' Left Behind series. He said in his book, No Fear of the Storm, no single verse specifically states Christ will come before the tribulation. Well, I want to go by what the Bible says. Uh, they're saying that there's no verse that really says Jesus is coming before the tribulation, which means he's coming when? After the tribulation. Um, you've got Darbyism that teaches the pre-tribulation rapture. The secret rapture of the church will take place before the tribulation. And then you've got... Um, and that also teaches it's not necessary really to understand the last 18 chapters of Revelation because the church will not be here during that fulfillment when the church disappears uh, because of the seven years of tribulation. By the way, can anyone here tell me where the scripture is that says seven years of tribulation? That's really putting my neck out on live television, international television, to invite you to give me a scripture. How many of you have heard? Turn a camera around in the studio. I want to see a show of hands. How many of you have heard of the seven years of tribulation? Put your hands up. That's a pretty good group. And how many scriptures did we find? That ought to tell you something. That's very interesting. And then, of course, you've got what the reformers taught, which is where I am. And we can all love each other if we disagree. Amen? Let's study together. And you know what? If nothing else, even if you say, Doug, I, I know where I stand, and you're not going to change my mind, fine. You owe it to yourself to at least understand your other brothers and sisters, right? So listen with an open heart, and let's find out what, what each other believes. The Reformers taught that the rapture of the church takes place after the tribulation. So let me tell you, uh, let me ask you actually a series of questions. In the Bible, let's talk about the tribulation for a second. Everyone here believes that Jesus is coming, and when he comes and descends from heaven with a shout, we're caught up to meet him. That's the rapture. We're caught up to meet him. When the children of Israel were in Egypt and the plagues fell, don't forget the seven last plagues in Revelation are the tribulation. When the plagues fell on ancient Egypt, were the Israelites taken out of Egypt before or after the plagues? After the plagues. Were they in Egypt during the plagues? Yes. yes. Did God protect them during the time of the plagues? Yes. Will we be protected during the time of the plagues? We don't need to worry about the plagues. Some people get so scared, they say, I don't want to believe the other way because I don't want to be in the world during the tribulation. You have nothing to fear. God will take care of you. That's what Psalm 91 says. Neither shall any plague come nigh your dwelling. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand. Only with your eyes will you see and behold the destruction of the wicked. Don't be afraid of the plagues. Did God save Noah from the flood or through the flood? Ah. Did God save Job from his troubles or through them? Joseph, did he go through trials? Was he saved from them or through them? Daniel... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they went through some trials. Did God save Daniel from the lion's den or through it? Did he save Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace or through it? The Bible tells us, Paul says, it is through much tribulation we will enter the kingdom of God, he says in the book of Acts. So all through the Bible we find this example. Why does Jesus say in Matthew 24 to the church, he that endures to the end, endures what? If we're going to go poof and disappear... Now, I'll tell you why it's so important to understand this. I meet people all the time, and sometimes I'll meet a husband. His wife is the spiritual one in the family. And he says, well, you know, she takes this very seriously, and she says that she's going to get raptured, and I'll have to go through the tribulation. And I guess, well, if she gets raptured, I'll, I'll get real serious then, because I'll have seven years. It'll be tough, but then I'll get my act together. Some people who believe that, it offers a second chance, and that's very dangerous. People who think they're going to have a second chance. And by the way, if whenever you're in doubt, believe the safe thing. 
if you like me believe that when Jesus comes the next time that's it you got to be ready now right Amen. if I'm wrong I'll apologize in heaven but if you're wrong <laughs> and you're counting on a second chance it's not safe now some are saying but Doug it says in the Bible Jesus is coming as a thief let's find out what the Bible teaches on that amen he is coming as a thief does that mean that um, it, people are just going to disappear it doesn't mean it's going to be a surprise I think it means it's a surprise. Does life go on here on earth for seven more years after Jesus comes as a thief? Let's read it in the Bible. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Many people stop right there. Keep reading. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. In the which, it means in this day, the heavens pass away with a great noise. And the elements melt with fervent heat. And the earth and the things therein are burned up. So what? What's the condition of the world when Jesus comes as a thief? Does it look to you like life is going on and people are saying, I wonder where everyone went? No, when he comes as a thief, the elements are melting with fervent heat. You could also read Matthew 24, verse 42. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would not watched and not to have suffered his house to be broken up. Now, I, I used to be a thief. I'll tell you more later. I don't want to say too much to begin with. <laughs> No, I was. I, I, did, I was a burglar. I've been in and out of jail. And, and uh, you know what? I never sent an advance announcement when I stole from anybody. <laughs> it was a surprise. Surprise was very important. And this is what Jesus means, is that it's going to be a surprise. Is it a surprise for the church or for the world? For the lost. Get your Bibles. You know, I, I read a lot of scripture on the screen, but I'd like to read this one. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 in your Bible. Let's read another one here. We'll start with verse 1. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 1. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, sudden destruction comes upon them. What happens to the wicked when Jesus comes as a thief? Destruction. Does life go on for seven more years? Sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they'll not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. It's not overtaken. We should know when that time is near. Amen? You are sons of the light and sons of the day, not of the night and the darkness. Therefore, let's not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. And so when Jesus comes as a thief, it's because the world was not prepared, but that's it. It's a surprise. Matter of fact, Jesus tells another parable. If you want to break into a strong man's house, you have to bind him. Does a man know when he's been wrapped up with ropes? Or is he going to go, what, where'd everybody go? The Bible says, let's look at some verses about the second coming. Quickly, we're going to go through them. Our God will come and shall not keep silent. I'm wondering if it sounds like a secret to you. It shall be very tempestuous round about him. You can also read, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, one of the noisiest verses in the Bible, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. Does that sound like a secret to you? Again, you can, and that was 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. Jeremiah 25, verse 30. The Lord will roar from on high and utter his voice from his holy habitation, and he will mightily roar upon his habitation. He will give a shout. That sounds very clear to me that when Jesus comes as a thief, that it is a very audible, loud, tempestuous event. Let me give you one more. Jeremiah chapter 4. Turn with me in your Bibles. Jeremiah chapter 4, we're going to go to verse 23. And here the prophet describes in vision the condition of the world just before the second coming. Jeremiah chapter 4, I'm sorry, just after the second coming. I beheld the earth, and indeed it was without form and void. That sounds like Genesis, doesn't it? And the heavens, and they had no light. He's not talking about looking back. He's looking ahead. Notice, I beheld the mountains, and indeed they trembled, the earth trembling. All the hills moved back and forth. I beheld, indeed, there was no man, and all the birds of heaven had fled. Now, what does that mean? They were there, but now they're gone. Don't forget about no man and the birds fled. Jesus talks about the birds and the carcasses in, Revel in um, Matthew 24. I beheld, and indeed the fruitful land, what was once a fruitful place, is a wilderness, and its cities were broken down. Why? At the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. And the word presence there 
Matter of fact, in the Greek, it's parousia, and it means the coming of the Lord. Question number three. Will the second coming of Christ be visible to all men? We've already found out it's very audible. What does the Bible say? Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and how many eyes? Every eye will see him. And again, you can read in Matthew 24, verse 30. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they will see. They will what? They'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. It's a glorious event. That's not something secret. And then shall appear the, uh, the sign of the Son of Man in the heavens, and all the tribes of the earth will, um, will mourn. It shall appear in the heavens. They'll see it. And they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So right away, you know that if someone calls you on the telephone and says, go grab your paper. Look on the front porch. See your paper. Turn on the news. Did you know Jesus came? You're not going to be watching reporters and pundits talking about, well, what was it like for you? And putting the microphone up in someone's face. Well, you know, there was this bright cloud and all of a sudden people started popping up out of the ground and it's not going to happen like that. When he comes again, everybody's going to know. Amen? It's the most glorious. It's the climax of the Bible is when Jesus comes. Who will be with Jesus at his second coming and why? Answer, Matthew 25, verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he'll sit on the throne of his glory. Who's coming with him? A few angels? How many angels are there? Well, if every person has one guardian angel and there's at least six billion people in the world today, don't forget that. There's billions of angels. These are the ministering spirits of God. Furthermore, his angels, speaking of his coming, will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And then again, you can read in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, this is when he comes again, in flaming fire to take vengeance on them that know not God. What happens when the angels come? They're taking vengeance on those that don't know God. That's why it's called sudden destruction when he comes back again. That's why the Bible says we should pray and watch and be sober lest our hearts be overcharged with drunkenness and the cares of this life lest that day overtake us as a thief. We should be watching because once that day comes, if we're not ready, it's forever too late. Friends, I just don't want your blood on my souls. I want you to know we've got to be ready now because we don't have another seven years to try to get serious about it. Now think about it in the Bible. He's coming with all these angels and how many angels? Billions at least, right? What was that number? Decillion? Maybe. We don't know. But there's at least the billions. Remember in the Bible when one angel, you can read in Matthew, came down and rolled away the stone. The glory of that one angel was so terrifying and awesome that a hundred Roman soldiers just collapsed with fear and then fled in terror. Remember that? One angel. One angel of the Lord went among the Syrian army and in one night 160,000 men were killed. One angel. Do you think if the Lord comes with all his angels that someone's going to say, you'll never guess what happened yesterday. <laughs> you should have seen it. I got a digital picture. <laughs> but it's all washed out because it was so bright. Well, I'm not going to say that. When he comes with all the angels, it's, it's going to be the end. Everybody's going to know that. Number five, what is the purpose of Jesus coming? Now, some people think, oh, he's coming to get even. That's not why Jesus is coming. Jesus tells us why he's coming. John chapter 14, verse 3, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. Why does he want to get us? Why is he coming? To receive us. He wants to be with us. He says, Father, I pray that those you've given me will be with me. What a privilege. Jesus, I want you with me. He loves you. And again, he says, And behold, <clears throat> this is in um, Revelation 22, 12, last chapter in the Bible. Behold, I come quickly. And if that was true then, boy, is it true today. And my reward is with me to give to every man. He's coming to give rewards. He's also coming for the restitution of all things. There's a number of reasons. But he's really coming to gather his children. He sends his angels to gather together his elect. Are the wicked destroyed? Yes. Why? By the brightness of his coming. It's because they still have sin in them. And the presence of the Lord, the light of God, is a consuming fire on the lost. Amen? Number six. <clears throat> What will happen to the righteous people when Jesus comes a second time? 
Well, there's a number of things in the Bible. First Thessalonians, we've already looked at, but let's review that. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and then the dead in Christ will rise first. So the righteous Christians who are alive in the world don't go before the dead who are resurrected when Jesus comes. The graves are opening up when Jesus comes. Does that sound like a secret to you? And this is happening in concert with this massive earthquake. All the graves in the world opening up. You know how many graves there must be that the angels have marked all over the planet? And the Bible even says the sea gave up the dead. And you might be wondering, Doug, how is the Lord going to reassemble all these people's parts? <laughs> Write that down. Send it in. <laughs> Again, you can read in 1 Corinthians 15. The dead shall be raised incorruptible and we will be changed. They're resurrected with glorified bodies and those who are alive get this body change. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. And it goes on to say, then we who are alive when the Lord comes, we are caught up together with them. Who's that? The resurrected saints to meet them in the air and we meet them with the Lord and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's how it's going to happen when Jesus comes. Does that sound like a secret to you? We're just reading it right out of the Bible. A matter of fact, I'll submit to you, I believe that Anybody who came here tonight with no preconceived ideas would never come to the place where they believe the secret rapture. It is a doctrine that was concocted, it was manufactured with a political purpose in mind, it was marketed very successfully, but it is not biblical, and the great Bible minds of the past never believed this. And you should do the research for yourself. I'm going out on a limb, and you ought to check on me and see if I'm right. And Send in your questions. If, if uh, you can show me where this has been the biblical teaching of the church, the foundation of God's church over the ages, it is a fairly new doctrine that is confusing a lot of people. In my radio program, you'd be amazed how many times people call. As a matter of fact, we don't even take the question because it's so frequently, it's redundant. Pastor Doug, I've been studying this secret rapture and I'm looking for the scriptures. Can you help me find them? And I say, no, they're not there. I can't help you find them. If you want to find out about the glorious coming of the Lord, there's a lot of scripture on that. But the idea of it being a secret, it's not there. Number seven, what will happen to the wicked when Jesus comes again? Do they live on for another seven years? With the Antichrist and the 144,000 Jews preaching the gospel, you might want to ask some questions about those things. It says, when the Lord comes, and then shall that wicked be revealed who the Lord will consume when he comes. He'll consume with the brightness of his mouth and will, um, with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So what happens to the wicked when he comes? Do they go on for another seven years or are they destroyed by the brightness of his coming? And some say, well, that, Doug, that's seven years later. Nowhere in the Bible do you find the scriptures splitting the rapture from the second coming. It's all united. It's interwoven through the Bible. Revelation chapter 6, verse 15 through 17, you got to stay with me, this is a long one. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, speaking of the second coming here, hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains, and they said to the rocks and the mountains, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who will be able to stand? And they're destroyed by the brightness of his coming. This is happening simultaneous with the trumpet, the roar, the shout of the archangel, the rapture, the resurrection. It is all woven together. You could link all these scriptures together in the Bible as one harmonious event. You cannot split it in half with seven years. Sorry about getting worked up on this. But you know what worries me? I'll tell you why I get excited about this. Misunderstanding this can set the stage for the devil to impersonate Christ and you to be deceived. So it is so important that you understand this, friends. Number eight, how will Christ's second coming affect the earth itself? What's going to happen on the planet when Jesus comes? Is it going to be where you're just going to read it in the headlines and not know? We read, and there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. Everything that can happen to the planet, it says islands are swallowed up. Mountains are leveled. Uh, volcanoes are erupting. It doesn't say that in the Bible, but you can count on it. 
And so the earth is going through this massive convulsion. That's why Paul says the whole creation groans and travails in labor. And when Jesus comes, it's the final convulsion of nature itself. When Jesus came the first time and he died on the cross, was there an earthquake? Did nature, did the sky go dark? What do you think is going to happen when he comes again? You think you're going to wake up and go to pat your wife on the hand and she's going to be gone, her pajamas are still in bed? I mean, this has been very colorful uh, teaching, but it is not biblical. Revelation chapter 16, verse 21. And a great hail fell from heaven upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Somebody emailed this picture of hailstones from the Midwest that someone took a picture of. Those are tangerine sized hail. They've actually had hail in North America as big as softballs and even bigger in India. I did an amazing fact on it one time. That is nothing compared to, the Bible says the hail is going to weigh about a talent. Uh, varying measurements, approximately 56 pound blocks of ice when Jesus comes back. Pummeling the earth. It's going to just, it, it'll be like those uh, bunker busting bombs that the military has. There's hail coming down. You think that it's going to be a secret? The whole, all of nature is convulsing. Number nine. Does the Bible give specific information regarding the nearness of Christ's second coming? Yes, and I, I have to be very careful at this point because whenever you talk about the eminence and the nearness of Christ's coming, if you get too specific, people think you're setting a day, and I don't believe anyone should ever do that. Jesus said, no man knows the day and the hour. And I still believe that's true. Matter of fact, every now and then, there's some, I remember there's a radio host. He's still on the air. It's amazing. I was doing a meeting back in, I think it was 90, was it 96 or 94? When uh, that, uh, you know who I'm talking about, said that he had a national radio program, Jesus is Coming, set the year and got everyone all worked up. Was it 93? No, I think it was later than that. 94? Anyway, I was doing a meeting. It was really good for my attendance because everybody all of a sudden came thinking the world was going to end. And nothing happened. And this has happened. Many people setting dates. You've got to watch out for that because you know what happens? People get let down and they lose all faith in Christianity. That's why I said you don't want to just get ready because you're scared. You want to be ready because you love him. That has to be the motive. But there is information. If you love the Lord, you want to know when he's coming, right? You know, when I've been on a long trip and I start getting home, I start calling Karen along the way. I said, well, I'm in Chicago and now I'm taking my leg down going through Nevada. And, you know, I called her on the way home. I'm getting closer. And then I call from the garage, you know. I'm here <laughs> on the cell phone. Let me share some things with you. If, if you do a little math in the Bible, how many of you have heard of the 7,000 year theory? It's a very simple principle. In 2 Peter chapter 3, speaking of the second coming of the Lord, I see some of you taking notes and I'm glad you're doing that. A day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day. And Peter is actually quoting from two different Psalms when he says that. A thousand years in his sight are as yesterday when it is gone. You know, it's interesting that God said to Adam, in the day you eat thereof, you will die. How long did Adam live? 900 years. No man lived a thousand years. They all died in that day, that first millennia. God works on a principle of six days you work, one day you rest. When you add up the ages in the Bible, anyone can do this. It tells you Adam lived 930 years and so forth. You just add it up and you have to compare a number of passages, but you can get an approximation of roughly how old the world is based on adding up some of these figures. And based, any of you ever heard of Bishop Usher's chronology? It was one of the more widely accepted chronologies. He places the creation at approximately, notice that approximately, I'm not setting dates, 4004 BC. There was 2,000 years from the creation to Abraham, who was born 4, 000, uh, 2004 BC. 2,000 years later. You've got the age of the patriarchs before Abraham. Adam, Noah, Enoch, Methuselah. They weren't Jews. Then from Abraham to Jesus is 2,000 years. You know when Jesus was born? This confuses people. 4 BC. How can Jesus be born four years before Christ, people say. <laughs> but you know what happened is once this monk established the AD BC dating method, Years later, they found out he was off. But by that time, it was all entrenched. It's like your typewriter keyboard. It is the craziest arrangement of letters. Why don't they go A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H? I still type with two fingers. It's so embarrassing on a plane. 
I'll be sitting next to some executive who's going, brr, brr, brr. and I open my laptop and go, ding, 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 ding. <laughs> and I've got to search for the keys. Anyway, after they established the AD BC dating method, they found out through archaeology that King Herod, who tried to kill all the babies in Bethlehem, died 2 BC. He had to die after Jesus was born. So they did a little more math. They realized Christ was probably born about 4 BC. So you got 4004 BC, then to Abraham 2004 BC, the age of the patriarchs. From Abraham to Jesus, the age of Israel. Then Jesus is born, you've got the age of the church or spiritual Israel from 4 BC to the second coming. Right about now, it's been 2,000 years from the first coming of Jesus, right? Matter of fact, we're living in that window between his birth and his death right now. Interesting. And how long is the millennium? A thousand years where we live and reign with Christ like a Sabbath. Friends, we are living in the last generation. I'm certain of it. And look at all the stories in the Bible. I've got a list here. This isn't very pretty, but it's a summary of a number of things. This is a chart. These are just some of the scriptures that talk about the sevens in the Bible. You know, the Jews had a law for six years you farm your land, the seventh you let it rest. They had a law that for six years you can have a servant, the seventh year he went free. Moses stayed at the base of Mount Sinai. How many of you know, how long was Moses on top of Mount Sinai? 40 days and 40 nights. But a lot of people don't know, if you read the verses just before that, it says he stayed at the base of the mountain for six days. And at the end of six days, on the seventh day, God called him up into the clouds. He went up, rapture, after seven days. I mean, after the sixth day. Mark chapter 9, you can read where Jesus took Peter, James, and John and he brought them up the glorious mount, this experience where he's transfigured. He makes this statement. He says, Verily I say unto you, there are some of you standing here who will not taste of death until you see the kingdom of God come with power. After he makes that statement, it says, After six days he took them up. Now I wonder if God's trying to tell us something. Read in the Bible the story, you know, there's only one queen of Judea. A wicked queen, daughter of Jezebel, her name was Athaliah. She killed all of the seed of David, tried to kill them all. She missed one, Josiah. Or is it Joash? Joash, sorry. They sound alike. You didn't know, so I, I don't feel so bad. He was hidden in the temple of the Lord. For six years, she ruled over the land a despot, wicked woman. I mean, any woman that would kill her grandchildren. At the end of six years, Josiah is brought out of the temple. Joash, thank you, dear. Joash is brought out of the temple, and he is coronated. The trumpets blow. She is slain. The people rejoice. It's a miniature picture of the second coming. Where is our high priest? Where's Jesus now? Isn't he at the right hand of the Father in heaven? And when he comes out of that temple, he's coming back to earth. He's going to receive his kingdom, just like all his parables told us. And that wicked queen you read about in Revelation is going to be destroyed, and he's going to be coronated. The trumpets are going to blow. There's so many parallels in these stories. God is trying to teach us through these symbols, the code of prophecy, to understand that his coming is very close. So it could be that this theory, 6,000 years before the millennium, and we have a lesson on the millennium. You know what that would put us? That would put us in the last generation. I believe some of us here may die. Not too many will die of old age. I think Jesus is coming very soon. Can you say amen? amen. And I should say, this is the most important thing you could be doing because if what I'm saying is true, what is more important than eternity? We're only here a little while and the reason we're here is to get ready to live with God forever. Amen? amen. I hope you'll continue to bring your friends to these meetings because this should be our priority. Seeking first his kingdom. Number 10. How may we know when we are near the last generation? Well, I've just given you some indicators. We talked about a few earlier. The Bible tells us in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 and 4, There shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? People will be scoffing, making fun of the second coming. Do we have that today? People that love to ridicule, especially the media. Generally speaking, the media is extremely liberal and they make fun of any uh, Christians who take the Bible seriously and they scoff. And the Bible says that's going to happen in the last days. Scoffing. Also, the Lord has warned us in his word that as it was in the days of Noah. What was it like in the days of Noah? There was a great deal of spiritual immorality. Am I right? Perversion. Do we see that very prominent today? 
Uh, people with perverted lifestyles are clamoring for attention and endorsement, and you're not allowed to call anything wrong anymore without being called intolerant. Oh, by the way, God is intolerant of some things. First Thessalonians, I'm sorry. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, But know this, in the last days, perilous times will come. This is verse 1. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Are we living in an age where people are lovers of pleasure? It's like we live for entertainment. And, uh, you know, if the remote control breaks, we're bummed. And what are we going to do now? You know, or the VCR is broken. What are we going to do? Cable went out. We just are constantly need to be entertained. Lovers of pleasure. Spiritualism is another sign. We're just adding these to the signs in our previous presentation. In the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. Is spiritualism in the programming everywhere you look? Harry Potter and Buffy and the witchcraft and sorcery and just it has become just ingrained in the culture. There was a day in North America where the church shunned that. Now Christians get mad at me for saying anything bad about Harry Potter. I like Harry Potter. It's all sorcery. And they, what they do is they make it cute. Isn't that how the devil operates? He tries to make something wicked attractive. How else do you get a fish to eat the bait except you make it look good? These are some of the signs, and there's many more that we could point to. Number 11, how near is the Lord's coming? Well, while we don't know the day and the hour, there are some final signs that we can consider. We want to review a few things that we talked about in our last presentation. We know that there have been wars and rumors of wars, and uh, we've seen that, these massive weapons of destruction. And um, uh, we don't have anything on us. There we go. We've got the natural disasters. We've got weapons that are much more dangerous now than before. The earthquakes, the fires, the floods, tornadoes, hurricanes. We had a whole series of hurricanes just this last year. And these things are accelerating in their intensity. God is trying to tell us through these events that are happening, everything from turn a camera around. Get a, get a shot of the audience here. Because remember, we've got a lot of friends watching around the world and we're sort of like the host site. How many of you, when you saw the images of 9-11 happening before you, were wondering, is this the end? Does this mean the end is closer? Is this a sign? Some of you were wondering if it was a Hollywood reenactment. Am I right? And when you heard the reports of the tsunami, were you wondering? God is wanting you to wonder. He, these signs are trying to tell us that the end is near and he wants us to get ready. Friends, I believe Jesus brought us because he's got a plan for you. He says, now when you see these things begin to happen, lift up your eyes, lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. That's good news. It shouldn't terrify you. It should warn you if you're not ready to give your heart to Jesus. Number 12, how can I be certain that I'll not be deceived by Satan regarding the second coming of Christ? How can I know? You need to go by the word. For as lightning comes out of the east, Jesus says, even unto the west, so shall it be in the day of the coming of the Son of Man. You know, lightning is one of the brightest lights that we have. And if you see lightning shining from one side of the sky to the other, and you're outside, have you ever tried to close your eyes during a lightning storm and it still goes through your eyelids? I even put my head under the pillow one time, closed my eyes, and I could still tell when the lightning flashed, not because of the thunder. You know what I'm talking about? Does anyone have to say, did you see that bolt of lightning go from the east to the west? Another way you'll know is if someone shows up walking around on the ground and they say they're Jesus, when Jesus comes again, you notice we're caught up to meet him in the air. Do his feet touch the ground? No, they will at the end of the millennium. We'll talk about that, but not when he comes to rapture up the saints. No. Go by the Bible. According to the law and the testimony, if they don't speak according to this word, there is no light in them. We need to find out what is the truth based on the word of God. Amen? And I'm encouraging you, please, friends, if I've said something you're wondering about it, ask the questions. Go to the Prophecy Code website, prophecycode.com, and email us your questions, and we'll do our best to answer them. We want to arrive at truth together. I'm pleading with you. Jesus warns us, wherefore, if they say to you, behold, he's in the desert, go not forth. 
Matter of fact, friends, if someone calls and says, hey, you know, he's on TV, turn to channel, I wouldn't even turn. Because I think the devil has hypnotic powers that can mesmerize people. Notice what we've learned about Jesus coming tonight. It tells us in the Bible it is a literal coming. He's going to come like he left. It's personal. He was real when he left. He'll be real when he comes. It's visible. Every eye will see him. It's audible. A shout, a roar, thunder, lightning. Very physical. The earth is going to shake. Every one of your senses will be assaulted with the reality of Jesus coming according to the Bible. It's vitalizing. A resurrection is taking place. Bodies are being transformed. It's glorious. The angels are there filling the heavens. It's climatic, meaning it's the end. That's where those that are saved are saved and those that are lost are lost. There's no extension. When God told Noah to get in the ark, did he give a second chance to those that stayed outside? When God said, Lot, get out of town, did he extend probation for those in Sodom and Gomorrah? And Jesus says, I'm coming back. It's like the days of Lot. It's like the days of Sodom. Get ready because that will be it. The curtain's going down, friends. These fanciful scenarios that have become so popular are dangerous. And we need to know what the Bible really teaches. You know, we're running out of time. And it's so important that we put Jesus first in our lives. Amen. You know, there's an interesting story from history about an Antarctic expedition. Ernest Shackleton, Sir Ernest Shackleton, made several expeditions trying to reach the South Pole. Once got within 100 miles, but he did not want to lose his men. So he turned back because he cared so much about his men. He didn't want to risk their lives. He got that close. On another expedition, he and his men got trapped in the ice in their ship. For a year, they floated among the ice flows, almost a year, freezing to death. He knew their only hope of survival was if they could get some help. Some of the men rowed to an island. All of the men rowed to an island. And he realized that they would not survive the winter without help. And he said, I will go for help and I will come back for you. He and a few men in a rowboat went 800 to 1,000 miles to an island where they knew that they could get help. The most uh, incredible conditions that you can imagine. And he promised them, I'll come back for you. So many times he wanted to give up, but he didn't give up because he kept thinking about his men. Finally, he came back. And boy, were they glad. He found help, and he could have rested, but he said, I'm going back for my men with you, with a rescue ship. Made the trip back, even though he was half dead. And when his men were rescued, they were all alive and waiting for him. They got on the boat. He said, did you lose hope? They used to call him boss. They said, no, boss, we knew you'd come back for us. And he said, were you packed? They said, we were packed. You know, Jesus is telling us, I'm going to come for you, and he cares for you more than Shackleton cared for his men. Are you ready? Are you packed? Do you want to be ready when Jesus comes? Amen. Friends, I want to pray for you right now. And I want to pray for those who are watching. He's brought you because he wants you to be ready. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, loving Lord, we are so thankful that you have arrested our attention tonight. Some of us may be uh, troubled by the things that we've learned in our souls. And we hope that's the Holy Spirit. We can see that every one of our senses will be bombarded with the reality of Jesus coming when he comes. I pray that our conclusions will be rooted in the word of God. And Lord, I pray that each person will hear you speak to their hearts and know that they can be ready, that you've sent these messages because you want them to be prepared, that you'll receive us if we come to you just as we are. And right now in each person's heart, I pray that they will say, Lord, I want to be ready. I can't do it without you. But through Christ, all things are possible. Help me to be ready and waiting and packed when Jesus comes. We ask you in Christ's name. Amen. Friends, when is our next meeting? Tomorrow night. Our lesson, very interesting, is the dragon's egg. We're going to talk about the role of evil and where the devil came from. And there's a lot the Bible says that we can be warned about the battle between good and evil. It's still not too late to bring your friends and see their lives changed. Amen? And so we encourage you to come back tomorrow night, tell your friends, and continue to pray for this series that God will bring revival. Amen. As humans, we all have addictions to sin. We're weak and unable to resist temptation. Ever since the fall of man, Satan has been working to destroy our happiness and drown out the voice of God with those soul-destroying addictions. 
Apart from God, we are powerless to resist evil. But by God's grace and power, we can experience true freedom from sin. Today's free offer, Tips for Resisting Temptation, covers 12 practical steps to have real power in your life today. You won't want to miss this practical guide for victorious living. Order online at amazingfacts.tv. Offer not available outside Canada, the U.S. and its territories. Or call 1-866-708-PROPHECY. That's 1-866-708-7767. Ask for the free offer number 708 when you call. Or write to us at Amazing Facts, Post Office Box 909, Roseville, California, 95678. Don't resist the temptation to order this book. The entire Prophecy Code seminar is available on DVD, VHS, CD, and audio cassette. Please ask for the respective offer number listed on the screen that matches the format you desire. To order, call 1-866-708-PROPHECY or 1-866-708-7767. Offer not available outside Canada, the U.S., or its territories. Or write to Amazing Facts, Post Office Box 909, Roseville, California, 95678. The future is now. Share it with a friend. God bless you, friends, and we'll see you tomorrow night. Thank you.